A lot of my she's leaving and we need a little bit of stick in hand you'll leave then. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. That's yeah. good. Right. Which means you may not have yeah. vacation I'm leave yeah. when you really want vacation said, leave. Oh, well. you don't have to <laughs> well, see, he's he's a boy. Yeah. Yeah. No. no. Yeah. Yeah. I'll tell you, our lake, our lake level was two feet above the dam. And that water was coming out across there and hit that flume and going up in the air 30 feet. How would you like to be in Bruce Tim? Yeah. I'd be scared. Oh, it was it was flowing through there too really fast. I mean, if that dam ever breaks, they've had it. Yeah. Years ago, we were both laid over and brought, and all that water came out of the water. One time. On downstream, Dr. J started this yeah. bridge across the creek. Blow it. On the blue stand. Yeah. Not, you may be not have. No, you got it. Okay. All right. Yeah. All right. Do you have another one? Oh yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, do you have another one after this one? Boy, no. Well, today I will. Well, I've seen flash floods out west. Not where we're not ready, especially from the air. Yeah. Yeah. You're up there. Yeah. This is where we're at right now. A wall of water about four feet high coming down Arroyo, and it's pushing up a dust storm ahead of it. And I mean, it's moving like 20 miles, 30 miles an hour. Let me see. See this flash water coming down? There's some, you know, about 15 miles down the road there. There's some people that are actually camped in the Royal out there. We're, we're flying over, tying messages to a bottle and throwing it out to them right for We finally got the message. Anybody need an outline of our study here this morning? Uh, we've been uh, looking at attitudes toward the death last uh, week while we looked at unbiblical attitudes toward death. Uh, so I've defined them as wrong attitudes because they're not in accordance with what God's will says about attitudes toward death. I made mention that the reason for this uh, particular part of our study is our attitude toward uh, the end of life for us uh, has... Uh, Everything to do with the rest of our studies, basically, if our attitude's not quite right uh, towards uh, death itself, then it does affect uh, our learning, our uh, studies uh, that we'll be making uh, of God's Word regarding this subject in our next few, next few lessons. Uh, after looking at, uh, last week, these unbiblical attitudes, ready to look at uh, what I've outlined is biblical attitudes toward the death of the righteous. And keep in mind, we're focusing here on the death of the righteous, all the passages that we're looking at <clears throat> in uh, this particular context. <clears throat> uh, Cal, you want a word of prayer this morning? Yes, sir. We'll begin. Dear Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this that you've given us, the rains that we've enjoyed gift of life, gift of love, friends and family with your son. We give you all praise and glory and honor for all the good things you have provided for us and for the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. We ask that you bless us today in our study as we look towards the end of life, the end times, that we may prepare ourselves so that we can share knowledge with those that are ignorant concerning you and your love and Jesus. Most our teacher, as he speaks to us, let us lead us in our discussion. Let us study these things in light of your word and use them to further the gospel. Ask that you continue to bless those that are not with us, either because of illness or illness of the spirit. Give them courage and show them the right ways. Continue to bless all of us in that great day. Gather all of us together. God bless the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, we'll begin this by looking at maybe one of the better, uh, well, one of the more well-known passages uh, regarding the subject here, Psalm 116 and verse 15. Let's see, Isaac, you want to start us off reading this morning, Psalm 116, <coughs> verse 15? Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. So viewed from God's perspective, uh, death simply means that one of his children is finally coming home. It's precious in the sight of the Lord, uh, the death of his saints. And so this helps us with our own attitude 
uh, toward our end of our earthly existence, uh, which is defined as, uh, as death, according to our subject. And then Isaiah 57 and verse 1 and verse 2 is another passage that helps us to determine the proper attitude we ought to have toward the death of the righteous. Mindy, you want to read that for us? The righteous perish and no one takes it to heart. The devout are taken away and no one understands that the righteous are taken away to be spared from evil. Those who walk uprightly enter into peace. They find rest as they lie in death. <clears throat> the context uh, of this statement is very important uh, in the context of this particular passage. Uh, wickedness was abounding in Isaiah's uh, day. Uh, great evil, turmoil was about to come upon the nation and upon society as a whole. You recall what's taking place uh, in the background here, the Babylon Empire. Uh, was about to destroy Judah, the southern two tribes of Israel, and in the process also uh, destroy several other nations around about Judah. So the whole society was going to be in great turmoil. It was at that time, uh, even while Isaiah is, is writing these things. But the passage here indicates that when the merciful or godly persons taken away, uh, that is by death, uh, they're removed from this evil to come, the present evil and the evil to come. It's actually a blessing to them. Uh, they, they'll be spared the calamity that everybody else is going to have to go through during the course of the evils coming upon uh, the nation, society as a whole. Uh, they don't want to escape the evil, but they will also partake in that well-being, wholeness, and completeness for which the soul of righteous yearns described as peace. Uh, they'll experience the eternal rest of victory and redemption. Uh, so in times of general turmoil, uh, the righteous, merciful, often caught up in the loss of life, but we can consider it from a positive perspective that such no longer have to endure the evils in society. They are now in peace. It's a biblical attitude that we ought to have uh, toward uh, toward death itself. Questions or comments on what we've looked at here in these two passages? Wait, just. I'm sorry? Christians look at death differently mm -hmm. than the world. Right. Should. And so when somebody who's been sick and been suffering physically mm -hmm. dies, uh, we may feel sad for for the family's loss mm -hmm. and for our mm -hmm. loss, okay. But we're happy for them. Yeah, that's right. Because they are relieved from the suffering now they're at peace. Mm -hmm. So We know that this life is not all there is, is the idea on things. And that's, that's why we can have the, uh, have the uh, sense of well-being uh, during the course of the loss of a loved one. <clears throat> because we know about things like this uh, that these passages bring to our attention bring your attention. Another passage that uh, helps us to form a biblical attitude toward the death of the righteous is this account that we have of the death of the rich man and Lazarus. We have this account in Luke chapter 16. And uh, dear, you want to read verse 19 through 25 there? Now there was a rich man There was a rich man, and he happily dressed in purple and fine linen, joyous, living in splendor every day. And a poor man named Lazarus lay wait at his gate, waiting with so covered with sores, and longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table. Besides, even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. Now the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. In Hades he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried out and said, Father, Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus so that, may he dip, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue, for I am in agony in this plain. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your life you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus bad things. But now he is being comforted here, and you are in agony. 
So in the, toward this passage, the, the righteous who have uh, suffered, in this case, uh, like Lazarus suffered evil uh, in this life, are immediately released uh, from that suffering and brought to, as is described here, Abraham's bosom. Uh, so we see Lazarus, he's carried away into uh, Abraham's bosom, carried away by the angels of God uh, into this blissful place. Abraham's bosom, uh, to understand the significance of this, we need to um, realize that this is uh, spoken especially for the benefit of Jews. Uh, Abraham is the father of the Jewish nation, the Jewish people. And to be in Abraham's bosom from a Jew's perspective would be the greatest of blessings that anybody could enjoy. And here it's depicted even after <coughs> one's life here upon this earth. Uh, they couldn't be in Abraham's bosom while on this earth because Abraham was long gone. But now then they can look forward to being Abraham's uh, close intimate fellowship uh, after uh, this life was over. Uh, the idea of uh, being in Abraham's bosom, uh, you know, um, we have uh, John is depicted, uh, although it's not actually stated, but the, the Apostle John is depicted as being one of the uh, closest in relationship to Jesus Christ. And it's described in passages like John 13, verse 23, where uh, John is lay, leaning on the bosom of Jesus. Uh, it was just a common uh, thing at that time. You'd be uh, laying on one's chest uh, if you were enjoying a close, intimate relationship with that individual. Uh, Jesus himself is described in John chapter 1, verse 18, as being in the bosom of the Father. It, it's just a term that... Uh, that everybody at that time realized described a close, intimate relationship with that individual that you were in the bosom of. Uh, so uh, this was a great blessing uh, and certainly would help uh, the Jews uh, who would hear this in their attitude uh, toward life after this life was over. And we ought to relate to it also. Uh, Abraham is not just the father of the Jewish people. In Romans chapter 4 and verse 11 says Abraham is the father of all believers. Uh, so it would be a great blessing for us too to be in this close intimate relationship with Abraham after this life uh, is over. Just some of the things we ought to learn in, 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 in this idea of having a proper biblical attitude toward the death of the righteous. Questions or comments on this particular passage? Yes, Pat. That's a good example that that's where Abraham is to the people that wondered about, well, where do you go after life? Yeah. He's in heaven. Yeah, yeah. He's a, uh, he is, uh, as we'll see here in a moment, uh, in uh, this blissful state uh, that the Lord has prepared uh, for those that are uh, the righteous, definitely so. Other questions, comments on this passage? And we're going to come back to this passage uh, several times in the course of our studies because it uh, bears quite a little bit on uh, the, uh, especially uh, what awaits us after this life is over. There's several things that we can see uh, from this passage in that regard. Another <clears throat> passage that uh, ought to help us uh, in regard to developing a proper attitude toward the death of the righteous is described as being in going away to paradise. Luke chapter 23 and verse uh, 43. Jesus on the cross uh, in between two thieves. And Janice, you want to read that for us, Luke 23, 43. And he said to him, Truly I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. Uh, based upon uh, this particular individual's uh, faith uh, that he is showing at this present time, uh, Jesus says to him, surely I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. The term paradise uh, was used to describe the Garden of Eden. Uh, you don't actually see the term paradise itself, as far as I know, in the Old Testament. 
but the Hebrew word uh, is there and then translated as like a garden or something like that. Uh, the Greek word is also used from time to time that, uh, that would be transliterated or translated paradise, and it may appear as a garden. It, it's, it, it's a term that uh, wasn't just used uh, in the Bible itself or by those that were inspired to write uh, the words of Scripture. The term paradise was used commonly in Old Testament times and also New Testament times to describe a, a beautiful, luscious garden, a place of bliss, a place uh, that would uh, provide all the beneficial enjoyment, enjoyable provisions that man could ever hope for. Uh, that's the origin of the word paradise here. But uh, to note it, uh, how it's used uh, other places in the Bible, the Apostle Paul <coughs> uses the term paradise, and I contend that he's using it with reference to heaven. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 1 through 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1 through 4. Uh, let's see, John, you want to read that for us? It is not expected, expedient for me, doubtless to glory, I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such one called up to the third heaven, and I knew such a man, whether in the body or, or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth, how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable word, which is not lawful for a man to utter. So Paul talks about being caught up to the third heaven, and he names this third heaven, or gives this third heaven the designation of paradise, the same word that Jesus used whenever he promised to the thief on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise. Third heaven, uh, to understand that uh, the first heaven uh, is uh, the sky, uh, where the birds fly, things of that nature. The second heaven is the area uh, where uh, the sun, moon, stars are. The third heaven uh, here that he's talking about is a place where Christ was at at the time. And he receives these revelations personally from Jesus Christ when he's caught up into this third heaven. And just pointing out that from Paul's perspective, uh, the third heaven he refers to here as, as paradise. Look also with me at Revelation chapter 2 and verse 7. Uh, Jesus uh, having John uh, write these things to the seven churches of Asia, and the first one here uh, being the church at Ephesus, and he makes a promise uh, to uh, those who would overcome the difficulties in this life, remain faithful and true. Uh, to God. Let's see, Dale, you want to read Revelation 2, 7? He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So those who overcome uh, the difficult of this life, and overcome uh, the things that were going wrong there at the church at Ephesus, Jesus promised uh, that uh, they're going to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. And this tree of life that he talks about, of course, and this is hidden on the chart or on your sheets there, your outlines, uh, is further made mention of in Revelation 22 and uh, verse 1 and 2 where John says that he was showed a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of a street on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. A figurative description of the heavenly home. It's the place that is before the throne of God and of the Lamb. Revelation chapter 4 and chapter 5. Uh, this is the heaven, the scene in heaven uh, that John saw in the opening of the book of Revelation. Uh, verse 14, Blessed are those who do His commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city, into this heavenly city that's described in Revelation chapter 
uh, 22 in, uh, in particular. It's described from this perspective as a going away to paradise uh, once this life is over. Gene. Is that also what's spoken of as the new heaven? Well, I believe, yes, that phrase, new heaven and new earth, relates to uh, heaven. And uh, that's one of the phrases that we'll look at also in our studies because uh, it's one of those phrases that uh, especially is misunderstood in the uh, religious world today. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses especially, they think of it as being a literal new heaven and new earth that's going to be created that they're going to dwell on. But it's used in a, in a uh, figurative way. Uh, sense. In fact, the term first appears in Old Testament times uh, describing the new age of the church. Uh, so it's used in different senses on things, but it is used uh, there in uh, Second Peter especially of uh, that heavenly home and also the book of Revelation is this new heaven, new earth uh, depicting the heavenly home. It's one of those terms, uh, like we've said before, uh, heaven is described in uh, or with uh, what we'd call material things, uh, streets laid with gold, things of that nature, and all these uh, uh, prized jewels and things. But uh, it doesn't appear to me that we're meant to understand that heaven is made up of all these material things. Uh, the terms are used so we can relate to uh, how beautiful uh, how blissful this place is. And same thing, new heavens and new earth. We... Uh, realize how uh, things are in this old heaven and old earth uh, because of the corruption it's gone through uh, due to the sin of man. And so we look forward to, as Peter says, the new heavens and the new earth uh, that is described as a heavenly home for the righteous. Yes, Cal? I've always thought of paradise being kind of, and Hades kind of being a, a waiting place until the judgment and then we'll go into God's heaven at that point. So uh, I, I see them as two different I know, two I know that's a common places. view, and uh, I'm going to talk about that in about two lessons away. All right, things. I'll wait. All right. uh, and, uh, and I'll just preface uh, at least on things, I don't have uh, any difficulty with maintaining that view of place of waiting for the righteous after this life is over. If that's what God holds out for us, a place of waiting uh, in what is described as the Hadean realm, I'll certainly accept it and I'm sure it'll be a blissful place and I'll let God take care of it on things. Uh, but I believe there's evidence that we don't go to a place of waiting. I believe there's evidence we don't go to a place of waiting. Uh, and uh, we'll, I'll, I'll relate that to you on things. I, I won't be dogmatic about it. I'll tell you that up front. I'm just going to relate my studies uh, to you on things. And a lot of it uh, has to do with this place called paradise. Uh, just right here, paradise. Uh, Jesus says, today you'll be in the paradise. Well, Paul calls the heavenly home, the third heaven, paradise. And Revelation 2 and verse 7 uh, that promise to be in paradise is uh, not described as a place of waiting, but the place where the tree of life is, uh, the heavenly home on things. But um, I could spend uh, the rest of the class study uh, relating to what I want to do whenever we get a couple studies away, because there's more to this, a lot more to it on things, for certain on things. But maybe I'll whet your appetite a little bit uh, on uh, maybe a different perspective. Uh, from the Bible itself, uh, then that Hadean realm, paradise on top and uh, torment on the bottom uh, on things, um, and us going to a place of waiting. Um, and here's another passage that relates to that. Any questions or comments on going away to paradise? We're just getting our general attitude right now. Whatever this paradise is, uh, the hope is that that's where we're going to be after this life is over. So that helps us in our attitude uh, toward the end of our earthly existence. Uh, Gene and then Pat. The, the, the promise that Christ made to the people of the cross would suggest that we're waiting for us. Yeah. Because the final salvation to which Christ was directed is not the one that he promised mm -hmm. to yeah. the people of the cross. Yeah. So paradise here is used as a, I think it's used as a word of prayer. 
<clears throat> and we'll, we'll look at all those things on things too. Yeah, we'll look at all those things. Pat, did you have a question or comment? Well, if that's true, then Christ is still in paradise. I'm sorry? Still, he, if that's true, then Christ is still waiting in paradise. Well, uh, see, the Apostle Paul uh, says he received revelations from Jesus Christ in that third heaven, and he says that was paradise. So Jesus was there then, and Paul says he's getting these revelations uh, directly. And uh, I, I believe uh, that there's evidence that shows uh, the apostles, and we know was, was in Jesus' personal company uh, for three, three and a half years. The apostle Paul did not have that advantage while Jesus on this earth. Uh, but I believe that he had about a three year period of time when he was in this third heaven in the personal fellowship of Jesus Christ receiving these revelations just like the apostles uh, were. I believe that on things uh, because of uh, putting some things together at least and how many times he talks about receiving revelation direct from Jesus Christ himself on things. <clears throat> Departure and accidents. Uh, another uh, pair of terms here that uh, help us to develop a proper attitude, <coughs> biblical attitude toward the death of, uh, of the righteous. And this also is kind of a preview, uh, give you a little something to think about uh, as to whether we go to a place of waiting or whether we go directly to be uh, with Christ in heaven after this life is over. Uh, Paul viewed his impending death as a departure, and that word is an interesting word uh, that's used by the Apostle Paul here. Second Timothy chapter 4 and verse 6. How about you, uh, Jack? You want to read that for us? And we know what he means by already being poured out as a drink offering. He's on uh, standing uh, before the Roman authorities a second time now, and uh, he's relatively certain that this time it's going to end in death. And according to historical records, he was put to death by the Roman authorities at this particular uh, juncture. And he says that uh, the time of his departure uh, now is at hand. Look also at Philippians in chapter 1, and if you would, uh, Pat, read verse 21 through 23. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I, on, but if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit for my la labor, yet what I shall choose I cannot tell. For I am hard pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. <clears throat> so the word depart, Paul uses it again here, departure uh, here. The Greek word depart, departure, interesting word. It was uh, used uh, by the Greeks at uh, the time that uh, scripture was being written, uh, number one, by soldiers. Uh, it was used by soldiers in regard to taking down their tent and moving on. Uh, moving on to their new location uh, is the way it was used. Uh, it was used by sailors uh, when they spoke of loosening a ship and setting sail, setting sail to a new horizon. In other words, it wasn't the end, the depart wasn't the end of their existence. Uh, it was actually a, a better thing that was going to take place because they're leaving this old place and they're going to a new place, uh, the new horizons. Uh, the uh, term was used uh, politically of uh, setting free a prisoner, uh, the keeper of the prison there at uh, Philippi, uh, whenever uh, the magistrates uh, decided they didn't have anything on Paul and Silas, uh, the keeper of prison said, uh, the magistrate said, you're to depart uh, and go in peace. Uh, so that was the word that, uh, that Paul is using here. It was used by farmers in reference to unyoking oxen from their burdens uh, so that the oxen then would be at rest. Wasn't the end of the exhaustion, uh, oxen again. It was uh, a time whenever they're released from their burden 
uh, and now then they could uh, rest uh, from their labors. I uh, just think that it's interesting to see how that the word was used in New Testament times. Uh, so to Paul, death was but a departure. Uh, it was uh, in these terms a, a breaking camp, marching on, moving on new location, departing the harbor and setting sail, setting sail to new horizons. It was being set free from the pressures and the afflictions of this world. It was being set free from the limitations and pain of the body and the weakness and temptations of the flesh. Uh, it was likened to this removal of this yoke, this burden of his toil in life. Uh, that's the word that Paul uses when he talks about uh, death. Uh, the end of his existence here on this earth, a departure uh, from this uh, world, and we'll get to in a moment, uh, this is far better. And he says, my departure, uh, when I depart, is to be with Christ. Again, on things. Uh, Peter, uh, he uses uh, a Greek word exodus. Uh, it's translated decease in this passage, Second Peter chapter 1, verse 12 through verse 15. Uh, but it does mean ex. It's the same word used uh, in the Septuagint in the Greek version of the Old Testament to describe the exodus from Israel, uh, from Egyptian bondage. It's the, that same word. And so it's a, uh, it, it's a pleasant word to think about, in other words, this exodus, uh, exodus uh, this exit from life. 2 Peter 1, 12 through 15, if you would, Cal. Therefore I shall always be ready to remind you of these things, even though you already know them, and have been established in the truth which is present with you. And I consider it right, as long as I am in this earthly dwelling, to stir you up by way of reminder, knowing that the laying aside of my earthly dwelling is imminent, as also our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. And one more verse. And I will also be diligent that at any time after my departure you may be able to call these things to mind. Uh, my uh, King James, New King James Version there in verse 14 has a footnote uh, where it says, put off my tent, die and leave this body. And that's what he's talking about. He's talking about his death. He's talking about he himself leaving this body. Uh, the real Apostle Peter is inside this body. And when death occurs, he's going to leave this body. Uh, and then verse 15 uh, talks about having his reminder of these things after my decease. And that word decease uh, literally comes from the word exodus uh, or used also in the idea of uh, departure. <clears throat> so it's used in these senses that is to present in our minds a pleasant thing about what is to take place with us after uh, we leave the earth, the existence after death. Questions or comments on uh, the, this terminology that Paul and the Apostle Peter uses here? <coughs> and then going back to Philippians in chapter 1 and verse 21 through 23, Paul describes uh, this as a gain, as something far better than living here on this earth. Donnie, you want to read that for us again? Philippians uh, 1, 21 through 23. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit for my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I cannot tell. For I am hard pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Mm -hmm. So he describes it as departing, be with Christ, and we'll have that here again in a moment here. But just focusing on, again, something help us uh, to have a proper attitude, biblical attitude toward death. Paul describes it as gain, as something far better than his present earthly e existence. Uh, he acknowledges that his departure uh, would be a loss for them, for the saints there at Philippi, but it would certainly be gain as far as he was concerned. He would enjoy something far better than what uh, was uh, taking place in his life at this present time. Questions or comments on this terminology that Paul uses? Yes, Count. Well, once again, it goes to our outlook on life. The Christian 
doesn't see death as a loss, but as a gain. Yeah. But for I mean, the vast majority of the world, they don't see it that way. It's a loss. Yeah. And so, well, at least he doesn't have any pain anymore. Mm. They don't say anything about gain, right? Yeah. Yeah. Or very yeah. rarely do they do so. <laughs> right. okay. yeah. It's focused but, on the loss. Yeah. But with a, with a righteous person, yuck. Yeah. Yeah. There's a loss. It's our loss, not his. Yeah. His yeah. is gain. That's right. Yeah, yeah, definitely, it's our loss. And that's what Paul's acknowledging. Uh, here, like he says there, verse 24, but didn't read to re remain in the flesh is more needful for them uh, because he can still be there to teach and encourage and strengthen their faith and things of this nature. Uh, and they could enjoy his personal uh, fellowship, things of that nature, and enjoy uh, the things that he writes about, too, as far as that goes. So it's a loss from everybody else's perspective to lose Paul, in this case, a loved one, but it was uh, certainly a gain for Paul to go on and, as he says, to uh, be with Christ, which is our next uh, next point. Question or comments on this one? Yeah. Next point, uh, to be with Christ at home with the Lord is the way our departure is described. And uh, no need to read it again. Uh, verse 23, he had this desire, Paul says, to depart and be with Christ. His departure is connected with, it looks to me like, an immediate being with Christ. Wherever Christ is on things, wherever he is, if he's in a place of waiting, that's fine with me on things too, on things. And I'll get to that whenever we have that uh, particular study. Where are the souls, the spirits of uh, the righteous uh, after death and before the judgment itself. That'll be a separate study. Look though, uh, also, uh, it's one of the passages we'll look at a little more extensively in the future, Second Corinthians in chapter 5 and verse 6 through 8. Second Corinthians 5, 6 through 8 here. Uh, the, the Apostle Paul, he's talking about in the context uh, when mortality is swallowed up by life. Mortality means whenever uh, our fleshly existence is over. And, and whenever that is the case, then we enjoy this being swallowed up by life. Um, we're back to you, Isaac. If you want to read that, Second Corinthians 5, 6 through 8. So we are always confident knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased rather to be absent from the body and to be the presence with the Lord. So you see the terminology that Paul uh, uses uh, uh, here in, in the passage. It, uh, death, the righteous, immediately enjoy blessed fellowship with the Lord. Um, to be with Christ, Paul said he, when he departed he'd be uh, with the Lord, uh, with Christ in Philippians 1.23. In this passage here, absent from the body, and then the depiction is he's present with the Lord, wherever the Lord is. And that's a key reason why death was considered by Paul to be a gain rather than a loss to himself, or to something far better than being in this life itself. Question or comments on what Paul states here? We're just focusing on biblical attitudes toward the death of the righteous. Whatever that means, uh, absent from the flesh, present with the Lord, uh, it ought to, in our mind, uh, conjure up the idea of something very, very blessed uh, indeed, and certainly far better than now. Asleep in Jesus, yet living with him, Another passage here that uh, helps us, I think, in our attitude toward death. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 and 14, if you would, Mindy. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. So Paul, he, uh, he wants to give these saints some assurance uh, with respect to those that have already uh, fallen asleep. And we'll talk about uh, how some, uh, I think, misuse that and think that there is such a thing as soul sleeping uh, that's depicted by the passage here. don't believe that's the case. But whatever uh, you want to view as sleeping in Jesus is, it's uh, still 
uh, something that is described as being a blessed, uh, a blessed situation. And he says uh, that uh, that God will bring with Jesus when Jesus returns those who sleep in Jesus, those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. Uh, Paul does say that those who sleep in Jesus still live together with him. Also in verse 9 and verse 10 of chapter 5, God did not point us to wrath, but obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. It's described death is sleeping in Jesus. And the passage says that God, Jesus Christ, are going to bring those individuals with him that are now sleeping in him at that final trumpet sound. Uh, some think, well, okay, uh, Jesus is going to bring them back to the earth. It doesn't say that in the context. It says that everybody on this earth is going to meet him and them in the air. There's no passage at all that says Jesus is going to set foot on this earth again. Uh, and it's one of those misconstructions, uh, misuses of passages, again, used by uh, much of the religious world. Questions or comments on this passage? Blessed rest from their labors, Revelation chapter 14 and verse 12 and 13. Dare you want to read that for us? Here is the perseverance of the saints who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, so that they may rest from their labors and their deeds follow with them. It's just one of the many blessings promised to those who patiently keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Uh, it says that they're blessed uh, because they are going to be resting from uh, their labors and their works do follow them. And in all this, when you put it together, uh, should give us this freedom from the fear of death. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14 and 15, if you would, Janice. Since then the children share in the flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and might deliver those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. So hopefully what we've looked at uh, is enough <laughs> to convince us that death is not to be denied or feared uh, but can be something precious even longed for uh, because of all the blessings uh, that death brings to uh, the righteous and as mentioned in the in the first part of uh, studying this and also here this morning uh, whatever conclusions or convictions we reach concerning the death of the righteous uh, must somehow fit in with these attitudes towards death as found in in the bible uh, so that's the, the reason for this particular part of our study, looking at biblical attitudes toward the death of the righteous. Questions, comments, Gene? Yeah, all of this rolls together to do the same thing. There is life after There is life after death, right? And that's a yeah. question of somebody who doesn't believe, who is uh, unconcerned about uh, spiritual life, question that they, that they can't answer is, do you believe that there's life after death? Yeah. And your actions suggest that you do not. <coughs> and all the scriptures that you would go through this morning indicate very, very prominently and perfectly in that show you there is life yeah, after death. Yeah, definitely life after death on things. And the ultimate proof of life after death is who? Jesus Christ. Uh, he was raised from the dead and heavenly home right now waiting the rest of the saints that he'd bring home uh, with him on things. Beautiful thought about all that on things. But he's the ultimate proof that there is life after death. Um, and all these passages, of course, uh, indicate that that is the case also. Um, convinced that a lot of the woes in our society today and uh, the, uh, especially the depressions that are found by a lot of people today is rooted in the fact that people do not believe in life after death. 
just do not believe in, uh, in this blessed state after this life is over. They don't have any reason to live for eternity that God said he's going to uh, bless us with, with all these blessings. And that was our second bell, I guess. Our, our time is gone here this morning. Appreciate your attention here this morning. Um, we're going to be out of town next week, and so I'll find out if uh, there's uh, anyone else who wants to teach class. If not, why we'll have you in the auditorium. Uh, but the week after, we'll start the nature of man. And as you can see by the many passages we've got here, we will not finish that in one <laughs> setting. And then after that is uh, our gospel meeting. And then after that, we're going to be gone for two Sundays on vacation. So we'll get a start on the nature of man here in a couple of weeks. Uh, but it'll be a, 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 almost a month of Sundays before we finish our stuff. You get to be amongst us. You ought to be just as thrilled as you can be. Good to right, Mr. Yeah. That's right. Thank you. How you doing, Jay? Tommy, oh, come in here all bone and everything. Oh, okay. All right. Make everybody feel all down the dumps. We wouldn't want to do that, John. You ought to be just as happy as you can be. I am good stuff. Well, well, we're not done yet. Yeah, well, I still have plenty of chance to muddy the water. <laughs> One thing people forget, time is an element here. Only here. Once you die, you enter the same realm that God's in where a day is as a thousand years and now years is a day. You might die in the next instant of what you realize is the judgment day. Yeah, that's right. You may just lay there in the grave. Right. That's, that's waiting, right. but to you it's not waiting. You're just and, and that's a good point. And you need to remember that because I may forget it whenever we get to that. That's why it doesn't bother me if there is what we call a place of waiting on things because God's going to take care of it whether there is a place of waiting. Well, there's only two people that didn't have to wait other than Christ. Elisha and Eve. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. They went to be with God. They went to be with God, yeah. And yeah. the rest of us died. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we'll look at those we died as the last. And it says that when Christ comes again, the ones that's dead, asleep, will rise first. Yeah. So they're not gone nowhere, because they got to wait till then to rise. Yeah, yeah. Well, they get, especially talk about their body. Yeah, that's what I mean. But they got to wait for them to rise. That's right. So they're still there. Yeah, that's right. But the the realm of time no longer has a meaning to it. That's right. So to them it may be like you died and it's a next thing you can do next instant is just just like Hebrews nine twenty seven. Uh one of the men wants to die after this the judgment. But then really give any indication there's a Wait well, judgment. I'll take it back. There's three people. The guy on the cross, too, because Christ said, You will be with me in paradise. Yes, okay. So he bypassed the way yeah. and went. Right. Unless, unless that paradise, like some teach, is the Hadean realm of place of waiting. Well, then, you'd have, then you would have to start teaching on a pre judgment. Uh, well, uh, now, and, in order and we'll for, order for yeah. somebody to yeah. die yeah. and go to Hades to wait, and these other, there's somebody else to die and go to paradise, which is different from Hades, yeah. has to be a pre-judgment. Yeah. Because well, it's before the judgment day. Yeah. Uh, the, and, and there is a sense in which there is a pre-judgment, I believe. Uh, and we'll look at that when we're talking about judgment. The final day of judgment, though, is uh, yeah, well, that's, sentencing. That's the, sentencing. That's the day that everybody's judged for doing right or wrong. You're not punished for it until after the judgment. Yeah. So if you are going to Haiti, you'd be being punished pre before judgment. So there has to be a pre-judgment. Yeah, yeah. well, those things are factors in our studies for sure. So, so that's why it always made sense to me that, hey, the next thing you realize is judgment. That's right. Yeah, that's right. When you enter into that, like you say, when, where time means nothing, whether well, there isn't any time. Yeah, time is just time this side. No concept that's right. Yeah. yeah. And that's, that's, right. that's just like eternity. Right. Once you once you die and time has no concept, eternity has no concept. Right. 